Um, so it's great to have James Tao here today, and he'll talk about um, this realization of the affine Hecker category as a monoidal co-limit. And I, I was very interested to see your paper a few months ago. So oh, there's you. more details on the archive if people would like to see it. It's already up. So. All right. Um, thank you, Jordy, and also, I guess, Matthew, for your invitation to speak. Um, today, I'd like to tell you about not only that result, but a whole family of results that can be summarized under the following main idea. So in representation theory, you often have monoidal objects, whether they're algebras or groups or categories, uh, which have a stratification indexed by a Coxeter group W. So that's some kind of Bruja or Schubert stratification. The, the main idea of these, this family of theorems that I want to talk about today is that such things can often be indexed as a monoidal colimit, that is a colimit in the category of monoidal objects, of their finite type subalgebras. So that's uh, subalgebras that are indexed by the finite standard subgroups living inside that Coxeter group. So it's a family of results about building the infinite from the finite. And this talk will be broken into two parts corresponding to before and after the break. In the first part, I'll talk about um, some of these co-limit theorems and say a little bit about the proof. And in the second part, I'll talk about a potential application. So let me begin by say, stating some theorems, hopefully uh, to a moderate level of precision. So let G be a finite type algebraic group. Let's assume that it's semi-simple and simply connected. Wi is the affine vowel group, so it's the vowel group of the loop group. And I is its set of simple generators, affine simple reflections. If you give me a set of simple reflections, I can associate to it the parahoric that contains those simple reflections. So these two theorems, which I want to discuss side by side because they're proved in the same way, say that some monoidal category, some big monoidal category is the co-limit evaluated in a category of monoidal categories of its finite type subparts. So this is D modules on the loop group with the convolution monoidal structure. This is the affine Hecke category. And these ones are defined similarly. I should say a word about what it means for a subset of simple reflections to be finite type. By that, I mean that the subgroup generated by those simple reflections is finite. So this is about building an infinite type Coxeter group from a finite type one. So these theorems are great. Um, you can make them even better. So I want to comment on potential generalizations at this point. First of all, you might wonder about this hypothesis, semi-simple and simply connected. In fact, with a little bit of bookkeeping, you can remove it. The basic idea is that rather than indexing this co-limit over the poset of finite type subsets of I, you can use a more sophisticated category, which is not a poset. It's called, well, Yakov Varshavsky in some talks he gave at Dennis Gatesbury's seminar, he called it the category of parahorics. So basic, that, that generalization is basically about playing a game um, with this indexing category to handle some connected components, which would show up here. Another potential generalization I want to say is that uh, you, you can, you can that both of these theorems are proved in the same way. They're corollaries of a certain master theorem, which I hope to tell you about today. And that same master theorem allows you to deduce analogs for all sorts of different Hecke categories. You can do monodromic variants as long as they're monoidal. You can even do variants for Katsumuri groups. So, I don't want to give the impression that these results somehow depend on the specific nature of these two categories because they don't. So I see that. Um, right, so in, in that talk of Varshavsky that I mentioned, uh, he announced a result that looks like this. His result. Is take is a colimit in the in the category of non-monoidal categories, and it looks something like this. So actually, this is not right. It should be. Uh oh. I uh, okay. There we go. This is a parabolic affine flag variety. So that's the result that Varshavsky announced that's most related to this theorem one. Um, in some sense, theorem one is a even higher categorical version of this and uh, even higher categorical in the sense that theorem, like 
in a concrete sense, to prove this theorem one, you need to sort of consider many convolution products of this result. And may, maybe a more abstract way to say it is that theorem one is more categorical in, in, in that somehow it, it would be easy to deduce this theorem one from Varshavsky's theorem if D modules on point mod the loop group was well behaved. But there's it, it, it's not possible to make this deduction because D modules on point mod the loop group is not really a good object to consider. So it's a it's a good and reasonable question to ask, can theorem one be deduced from Varshavsky's results or theorem two for that matter? But I think the answer is no, at least not easily. So before I go towards stating this master theorem that everything is deduced from, let me tell you a little bit about motivation. Why might you care about these co-limit theorems? The motivation comes from the idea that many of these monoidal objects we're interested in can be presented using generators and relations. I'll take this table row by row. In the first row, at the categorical level of sets, so we're talking about groups, monoids, algebras, and so on, we have the most classical objects. We have the vowel group and its Hecke algebra, which is a deformation. As is well known, these things are more or less defined in terms of simple reflections as generators, and they satisfy one-term relations, S squared equals something, and they satisfy two-term relations, the braid relations. Because of that, we can immediately deduce that they satisfy a certain co-limit theorem where this co-limit is evaluated in a one category of like algebras or groups. Namely, it's easy, if, if I want to take a monoidal co-limit of algebras, which are presented by generators and relations, it's very easy to get a presentation of the co-limit. Namely, I just take the union or amalgamate the generators and the rel relations that show up. Since each two-term relation shows up in one of the rank two subalgebras, I can immediately deduce the known presentation for A. So let's move on to the next row where I go one category level up. Now I'm working with objects that look like categories. I can look at the vial group viewed as a discrete groupoid, that is viewed as a sort of group object in a category of groupoids, or I can look at the Hecke one category. We know um, that these things can be presented in terms of simple reflections, the same relations as before, but now we have certain three-term relations, which Elias and Williamson called the Zamologikov relations. So I'll say a little bit more about that on the next slide, but the point that I wanna emphasize here is that the appearance of three-term relations in these presentations means that the co-limit needs to we, we need to go to rank three out, include rank three algebras in the co-limit in order to get a valid co-limit theorem. And the reasoning is the same as before. So now going to the infinity categorical level, you might imagine that you could have n term relations here for any n. But what the co-limit theorem that I claimed on the last slide says, very schematically, is that any relation that you would need to present these sort of sorts of objects in a topological or infinity categorical setting in fact lives not inside some rank two algebra, but inside some finite type subalgebra. So this is basically saying that the relations that you would need all live appear if you only look at one finite type subset of simple reflections at a time. And I should mention that this presentation of the vial group as a discrete Picard groupoid was given in this paper, Diagrammatics for Coxeter Groups by Elias and Williamson. And I should mention that the presentation for the Hecke category, even an affine or a Katz-Moody Hecke category, it goes, goes back to tilting modules and the p-canonical basis by Riesch and Williamson, where they consider the Hecke category incarnated in terms of parity sheaves. So let me say a little bit more about these amylogical relations. The one-term, two-term, three-term, and so on relations that show up have a natural geometric origin in the different faces of the root hyperplane arrangement. The one-term relations or the quadratic relations, sometimes called wall crossing, come about from the one-dimensional faces of the hyperplane arrangement, or that is the hyperplanes themselves. The two-term relations come from braid relations. Here I've drawn a rank two root system. If I go from one chamber to its opposite one, there are two different ways to cross, and those two different ways somehow correspond to these braid relations with alternating products. The three-term relations, then should correspond to face uh, co-dimension three faces in the hyperplane arrangement. Here I've drawn, or rather copied, a rank three root system. And you could imagine that if I wanted to go using wall crossing 
from one chamber to its opposite one, then there's sort of a whole circle's worth of paths. And since there's a circle's worth of paths, if I take two opposite ones, there's sort of two different homotopies that I could take to turn one path into the other one. The Zamologicon relation somehow says that these two homotopies ought to be the same. And that is because, sort of morally, it's because there is this co-dimension three uh, face in the root hyperplane arrangement that I can pass through. So if you've looked at these root hyperplane arrangements before, you'll know that often it makes sense to put in all of the co-dimension, you know, co-dimension n faces for any n. For example, if you've looked at the Selvetti complex, it's not the same thing as its two skeleton. There are these higher dimensional cells that you have to put in. And you may have seen in those settings that those higher dimensional cells sort of only obtain for, they're sort of, each higher dimension cell you put in only sort of sees a finite type subset of simple uh, reflections. So that's some more motivation for where this co-limit theorem comes from. In the rest of this part one, I'd like to try to introduce enough definitions to state this master theorem that I promised. So to start, the master theorem pertains to co-limits indexed by a certain category, and that's the category that I'll introduce now. I define the category of words as follows. It's a one category, not an infinity category. The objects are just sequences in the affine vowel group, but each letter in these sequences must be finite type. Finite type here means that that letter is contained in some finite standard subgroup. In other words, that it involves a finite type set of generators. A morphism between two sequences is, an, is a weakly increasing map on their indexing sets, satisfying a certain inequality, whose meaning I'll tell you now. The inequality says that for every letter in the target, I look at the letters in the source word that are sort of mapping to it. I take their Demazur product and I require that the letter in the target is greater than or equal to the Demazur product of the letters in the pre-image, greater than or equal to in the strong Bruja order. And that is true, has to be true for every single letter in the target. So this seems like some arbitrary mm -hmm. definition. The next thing I want to tell you is okay. what is it? Go ahead. Uh, what is the mother product? So uh, there's a concrete definition, but the definition that I want to give for the purposes of the next slide is its set theoretic convolution of Schubert varieties. So if I have W1 and W2, the Demazor product is, is, can be geometrically defined as follows. I take the Schubert variety indexed by W1, I take the Schubert variety index by W2. I take their set theoretic convolution. That's an irreducible uh, B equivariant variety. So it, it too is the closure of some Schubert variety. Let's say it's indexed by W. That's the Demazor product of W1 and W2. So I could say it equivalently as follows, sort of if I look at Bruja double cosets, you know that this product breaks down as the union of some Bruja double cosets. And the highest term in that union uh, is the Demsor product. So that's actually a good lead into the next slide where I explicitly consider these convolution products of Schubert varieties. So the point is that every element in this category of words can be interpreted as a convolution or twisted product of Schubert varieties. In other words, there's a functor from word into algebraic varieties. So let me introduce a more general piece of notation. P sub W is just the closure of the W Bruja cell. A word, which is a sequence of vowel group elements, encodes this sort of convolution variety where the I's on top mean uh, quotients with respect to the Iwahori subgroup. And expressions like this show up, for example, when you define bot samuelson resolutions, which are a special case. A morphism of words, this definition here, is contrived so that whenever you have a morphism, you get a convolution map between uh, one flag variety and another. Let me illustrate that in an example. For the affine extension of A1, which is a diagram that looks like this, with two simple reflections, which I'll call S and T, I'm going to tell you one possible map of one possible morphism between two words. 
here's a word STS, here's a word S1 STS, all one letter. The underlying map on the index sets will send S to S, and it will send both of these to STS, and nothing will go to one. So the underlying map on the index sets can be neither injective nor surjective. This is, in fact, a morphism in the category of words because the Demazor product of T with S is TS, and that's dominated by STS. The morphism of algebraic varieties that that corresponds to looks something like this. And as a formula, it's given by multiplying the coordinates of a point in here in exactly the way that's specified by the map on the underlying index sets. So it sends G1, G2, G3 to what you get when you multiply G2 and G3 and you insert one here. So that defines a valid map from this quotient variety to this quotient variety. But wait a minute, uh, is STS an allowed element? I thought you, you wanted all elements of the while group to lie in some uh, uh, finite type standard. Oh, um, mm, okay, that, that's a good point, yeah. So, um, I think the simple, so that, that's very valid. This is not a finite type element. So I think the simplest way to fix it is to say that this is finite type A2. <laughs> but yeah, thanks. That's right. So next, let me tell you what in the world this category has to do with what I originally promised, that is computing these monodal co-limits. You might remember from ordinary algebra that a co-limit in a category of, say, algebras or groups can be concretely described as follows. An element in the co-limit looks like some equivalence class of arbitrary sequences of elements in the things you're taking a co-limit of. The equivalence relation looks something like multiplying together two adjacent letters if they both happen to lie in one thing that you're taking the co-limit of. So it turns out that you can deduce from higher algebra that monoidal co-limits of infinity categories have a similar description. If I want to compute this co-limit in the category of monoidal categories, I can rewrite it, at least I can rewrite the underlying plane category as a co-limit, as a non-monoidal co-limit of products that look like this, where this indexing category is something that goes through all, po all possible sequences of these j's. So I won't say anything more about the details there, but this is an infinity categorical generalization of that familiar idea of amalgamated products from ordinary algebra. Next, using a simple adjunction argument, you can convert this into a category, into a co-limit that's indexed by the category of words. I should say that this motivates why I wanted to require that these letters were finite type. I want there to be a map between objects like this to objects like this. These j's were supposed to be finite type, and the requirement that I need to impose is exactly that this W is finite type. So the point is that I can convert these monodal co-limits into non-monodal co-limits indexed by the category of words. Something similar is true for D modules, for the affine Hecke category as well. And in every, every variant of this theorem that I have in mind, this would be the first step. So Ben Elias asked a question of how to think of this category, um, how to think of this category. Um, I'm not sure why parity sheaves appear. So what, what I mean by this is there's a theory of D modules on, on uh, pro-algebraic varieties. In fact, there's a theory of D modules on in pro algebraic varieties. And I mean that this is all D modules on the pro-algebraic variety, which is P sub W. So finally, and we're almost done with part one, I want to introduce some definitions and state this master theorem. The master theorem will be about computing a co-limit indexed by the category of words. So for any morphism in the category of words, I'll call it a strict embedding if the underlying map on index sets is a bijection and that map is not the identity. 
The word strict embedding comes from the fact that the corresponding maps of convolution Schubert varieties will be closed embeddings that are not the identity. I'll also call a map birational if and only if the corresponding map of varieties is birational. Next, this master theorem will be an inductive characterization. So I'll define what it means for a word to be less than or equal to a specific element y of the affine vowel group and what it means to be less than y. So I'll say that a word is less than or equal to y if and only if the corresponding convolution Schubert variety, which always maps to the affine flag variety, its if its image is in fact y Schubert variety. So here there's no requirement that y is finite type and I don't want there to be one. Moreover, I'll say that this word is y relevant if this map is in fact birational onto the y Schubert variety. And I'll say in contrast that the word is less than y if and only if it factors through its boundary. So the boundary is the union of all the non-open cells. And finally, here's the master theorem, which allows you to compute, well, it helps you compute a co-limit of some functor that's defined on the category of words. I need to assume a kind of smoothness of this functor f. I need to assume that for every birational map, the following diagram is co-Cartesian. You should interpret this diagram as follows. This horizontal arrow sort of compares the difference between f on w and f on things that have a strict embedding into w. So this is some kind of discrepancy between a whole Schubert variety and its boundary. In other words, it's what I need to put in for the open cell. This is an arrow in the same vein, just replacing w prime with w. And saying that this diagram is co-Cartesian says that uh, the two discrepancies are the same. And intuitively that says that no matter how I choose a bot samuelson resolution, the thing I'm putting in for the open cell should be the same, no matter which resolution I choose. So it's some kind of smoothness of the functor f. The conclusion then is something that allows us to go from a partially computed colimit over the words less than y to knowing the next step partially computed colimit for words less than or equal to y. Namely, if w is any y relevant word, the following diagram will be co-Cartesian. Here we see the same arrow that I discussed before. And this diagram tells me that what I need to add in to go from one step of this colimit computation to the next one is exactly the discrepancy that I mentioned before that comes from the open cell attached to y. So to sum up, this master theorem is giving us an inductive way to compute a colimit indexed by the category of words. So, sorry, so, could, you give a, could you give an example of like strict embeddings and? Sure. So, actually, here we sort of implicitly saw an example of a strict. Uh, okay, maybe we did it. Um, so, anytime you have, say, a letter W1 is less than in the Bruja order a letter W2, certainly. PW1 includes into PW2. And similarly, their quotients by the Iwahori include. And this is an example of a strict embedding. In some sense, every strict embedding is just a uh, is just a product of these. So strict embedding just means take all the letters, don't merge them in any way, just make each letter, make some of the letters bigger by some amount. It's like a generalized sub-expression, kind of. Sure, sure. Yep. Right, so so in in this that's a good point. In the special, a, a lot of this is motivated by the classical theory of bot samuelson resolutions, which in some sense is when these words have every letter being uh, being a simple reflection, and in that case you could have a word that looks like s one one t one, and then I can make it bigger by changing it into s t s t s, and this map would be a uh, strict embedding. And as you can see, this is sort of exactly the same as saying that ST is a sub-expression of ST, STS. And, and birational, like I was looking for braid relations to show up somewhere, but I don't see them yet. Uh, so is like birational would be STS goes to S comma T comma S goes to SDS? Exactly. So, so the, the keyword here is linked additive product. So a map is birational if and only if 
Understood. All the products are length additive, and that's that. That's exactly what shows up in the reduced lift presentation of of the brake group. So that's the motivation for that. Okay, so we're just about done with the first part. I just wanted to uh, write down more precisely this geometric intuition that I was saying before that these diagrams correspond to blow up squares of algebraic varieties. So as before, I mentioned that these arrows are sort of comparing the boundary of a convolution Schubert variety with the whole thing. So they differ only in this map, which is birational by assumption, is an isomorphism on the open cell. And this is Cartesian because the pullback of everything that's not in the open cell is everything that's not in the open cell. And a similar remark applies here. So the, the upshot of this little intuitive explanation is that this thing that I called bistratified descent uh, can be applied whenever you're working with a sheaf theory that satisfies descent with respect to blow up squares. And all uh, constructible sheaf theories, like D modules, constructible sheaves, and so on, will satisfy this. And so you can apply this theorem. Now, I should say that I'm not literally taking sheaves on these twisted Schubert varieties. If you recall from this slide, I'm taking D in any particular application, I have to take uh, D modules or constructible sheaves on something that kind of looks like twisted Schubert varieties, but, but not actually. So generally speaking, the, the descent statements you want are, are, are a little bit stronger than just saying that the D modules satisfy descent for these particular squares, but it's morally the same. So that concludes the first part of this talk, and it's been just about 26 minutes. So maybe we should break for five minutes and come back later. And I guess I'll be here in case anyone has any questions or comments. Will you at any point say anything about the proof of this by stratified descent theorem? Um, I wasn't planning to for this talk, but I can say something now. So this proof is actually a sort of somehow everything in this proof is easy except for a very gritty proof that a certain uh, simplicial set is contractible. And, and basically that comes in because you might ask, so, so this theorem might seem implausible for the following reason. The conclusion says that the co-limit can be inductively computed by putting in a new Y relevant word each time. So you might ask, what about all the non, what about all the words that are not Y relevant for any Y? Those are the words that aren't, of course, that are like simple, that are correspond to strings of simple reflections that are not reduced. So somehow the Y relevant words are like reduced expressions for different file group elements. And then there are all of these non-reduced expressions. Well, the Coxeter exchange deletion lemma says that anytime you give me a non-reduced expression, I can sort of shift it around with braid relations so that a certain deletion is visible. S appears next to S. Then I can delete it. So, but generally speaking, well, for any particular simple expression of simple reflections, there's a, the, 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 the lemma actually gives me a canonical way to do this. But when I'm working with these more general words, you can sort of do this in, in multiple ways. You can sort of shift the redundancy to the left. You can shift the redundancy to the right. If, if, if there's a lot of redundancy, you could sort of have two different possible deletions show up at the same time. And it becomes difficult to see why the deletion can be done in a canonical way. And if it cannot be done in a canonical way, it will affect some homotopy groups that show up in these co-limits. So the main technical work in this theorem is to prove something about contractibility of the space of possible deletions that occur when you freely use this idea of the Coxeter deletion level. So the, the, the presentation that you mentioned for the classifying space of a braid group, is that something that you can deduce from your state? How is it related to? So it's, it's a basic ingredient in proving this theorem. So basically, what I just said has to do with going from the braid group to the vial group. The vial group differs from the braid group because it has additional relations that decrease the length, S squared equals one or S squared equals linear times, constant times S plus one. 
So the presentation for the braid group that I mentioned, which perhaps you know, makes sense homotopically as well, um, sort of tells you that when there's no deletion relations in the picture, that everything is nice. And then what I additionally proved, which is the main input into this theorem, is that things continue to be nice when you put in the deletion relations. Thank you. That's, that's... So I was about to ask you in the same, uh, uh, to continue this question. Um, I mean, do, can you reprove or uh, do you basically use uh, the uh, contractibility uh, statement for the affine black group, the fact, the fact that uh, the hyperplane component in the tit cone is a, is a K pi one? Um, so that's the K pi one question. Um, Nothing, nothing that I'll cover in this talk uses, uses the k-pi-1 conjecture. And the moral reason for this, which I can go into in a little appendix after the talk, which I have prepared, is that I never really need the braid group for anything. I only need the braid monoid. So you have a, a weaker, you have a, um... I mean, you do have something uh, about the braid monoid, which would be a, a... So any, any collimate theorem for the braid monoid is already known. Um, for example, you can, in, in, you, you, can, you can write down a, an analogous collimate theorem for the, braid, for the braid monoid, or perhaps even the braid group. Um, So I'll, I'll reveal that I prepared this little appendix. Basically, if you look at this famous paper by Deline, actions of the braid group on a category, and you also look at this follow-up paper uh, by Dobrinskaya, um, you, you can very easily deduce from their results an analogous column at presentation for the braid group. So I wouldn't say braid that- Braid monoid, no, the, the critical thing is braid monoid versus braid group, no? Right, so so if you so the argument for the Coleman theorem for and, and these presentations for the braid monoid is somehow very concrete, um, and passing from the braid monoid to the braid group uses this result of Dobrinskaya, which says that the two things are equivalent, saying that you can get the braid group by just groupifying the braid monoid in a homotopical sense, if and only if the k pi one conjecture holds for that Coxeter diagram. So in this picture, basically, I don't ever really know how to say something about the braid monoid, uh, sorry, the braid group. What I know how to say is say things about the braid monoid and then just hit it with this. So if the k-pi-1 conjecture is true, I can say things about the braid group. If it's not true, then I can't say anything about the braid group. But I should say that I'm not claiming in my talk to have proved anything new about the braid monoid or the braid group. Mainly this, this theorem um, that I mentioned really is like the, the, the main technical work in the theorem is really about how to put in the how to put in the quadratic or deletion relations into a braid group picture that's already understood. I guess I have more questions about this, but maybe we should continue. Uh, okay, so sounds good. Um all right, so let's begin the second part of the talk, which is about applications. So I'll focus on, on applications of the Coulomb theorem for the affine heck category specifically. On this slide, I want to just state kind of what the Coulomb theorem tells you at, at, at a very, um, at a very na na naive level, at, at a naive and, and level of maximum possible generality. So, so suppose we wanted to construct a functor from a monoidal functor from the affine Hecke category to some other monoidal category. Since we have presented this as a colimit, it should be easy to map out of it. For simplicity, let me assume now that I'm dealing with an irreducible root system. What the colimit theorem tells you is that it suffices to give some functors on the largest possible finite type subcategories, 
and then say how these functors agree on the overlaps. So for the with this irreducibility assumption, the largest subcategory subcategories are those that exclude one simple reflection, and I have to choose a monoidal functor from those to see. Then on the overlaps, I have to choose a natural transformation respecting the monoidal structure from the restriction of one functor to the restriction of the other. And you might imagine that there's higher compatibilities as well. On the heck of subcategories that exclude three simple reflections, I have three different functors from that to see. These functors have already been identified in pairs, and I need to know that, the that this diagram commutes. In other words, that the composition of these natural transformations equals or is identified with this natural transformation. In a fully infinity categorical setting, that would be extra data, and there would be a higher chain of associativity constraints involving you know, tetrahedra and so on. So that's what the Kolomit theorem tells you in a naive level. You can say a little bit more um, if you are willing to restrict your problem. So let me first discuss the following very special case. Suppose I can find a T structure on C. And suppose I was only interested in constructing a functor, which sends every tilting generator in here into the heart with respect to that T structure. I claim that to, to apply the previous characterization, I don't even need the infinity categorical colimit theorem that I discussed in the first part of the talk. I only need the one categorical colimit theorem, which as I mentioned on a previous slide follows from the Elias Williamson presentation. I, I don't want to get too much into the infinity categories, but roughly speaking, this is because mapping into the heart of a T-structure enforces a kind of truncatedness. The axioms of a T-structure imply that negative x between two things in the heart must vanish. Since we're in cohomological indexing, those negative x correspond to the vanishing of some positive higher homotopy groups uh, of some mapping space. And so intuitively, you should think of this as saying that we're mapping into, when we map into the heart, we're actually mapping into a category where the mapping spaces have some kind of discreteness. And that intuitively is why in this case, I don't need the infinity categorical colimit theorem. If I want to move outside of this special case, I would need the infinity categorical theorem. Let me discuss a mildly more general possible application. Mildly more general because I don't want to work with arbitrary infinity categories because it becomes very hard to check those higher associativity conditions. How the key idea that I want to propose to you now is that I don't need to assume that there's a single T structure which receives all the tilting generators inside the affine Hecke category. I, I only need to assume that there's a T structure for each different I, that there's a T structure which receives all the tilting generators in the finite type subcategory that excludes I. This is more general because I can now use a different T structure on C for each simple reflection I. But it still does what I want, which is the relations, you know, these compatibility conditions that I have to check are occurring in a category that thanks to this T structure chosen for I is now somehow discrete enough that I can pretend I'm working with an ordinary one category. In fact, the specific application that I'd like to discuss that of mapping from the affine Hecke category into the finite Hecke category in type A, I think is of this form. So it doesn't fall under this slide, but it does fall under this slide. So from now on, I want to be in type A. So I'll let I be the affine extension of the Dinkin diagram AN minus one. So it has the finite type vertices one through N minus one along with the affine vertex zero. And just for concreteness, I'll let the reductive group I'm working with be GLN. So the following question was asked in uh, Kostya Tolmachov's thesis. Is there a monoidal functor from the affine Hecke category to the finite one? So here I minus zero is just a fancy way of writing A sub N minus one, the finite type Hecke category in GLN, which is compatible with the following map of braid groups. I don't want just any monoidal functor. I want one that's compatible with this map. Let me, I've described this map in a picture taken from Kostya's thesis, but let me explain it in words. Recall that the affine, recall that the affine braid group can be interpreted as braids that are taking place in a punctured cylinder. 
So I'm drawing the puncture of the cylinder, and these braids somehow can wrap around the puncture. That's equivalent to saying that the affine braid group on n strands it, with, with n transpositions is equivalent to the subgroup of the braid group on n plus one strands, where you insist that a strand, certain strand is distinguished, the red line here, and that it has to go back to the same point that it starts from. So the correspondence between these two is just the puncture of the cylinder identifies with the distinguished strand. The map of braid groups that I'm interested in is simply the one that deletes the distinguished strand. In the cylinder picture, that corresponds to taking the braid that wraps around the cylinder and just forgetting that there was the puncture, just putting it in R3. So that's the question. Now, what did Kostya Tomatov do in his thesis? Well, Roman's equivalence on two geometric realizations states that the affine Hecke category, which up till now I've been thinking of in its constructible incarnation, identifies with the derived category of coherent sheaves on a Steinberg variety. I won't be precise about what kind of Steinberg variety. Costa's thesis constructs a functor from the subcategory of perfect complexes into the desired one. So since, since I think in your seminar, you've discussed a little, a little bit about central sheaves and some ingredients for Bezrakovnikov's equivalence, I'll say a little bit about how those ingredients manifest to tell you about what Costa's functor has to be. The key, one key idea in Roman's equivalence is that this category can be presented somehow using specific generating objects. It's generated by vector bundles that correspond to uh, line bundles that are indexed by weight, pairs of weights of the torus tensored with finite dimensional representations of the group G, which remember is GLN. So this is a equivariant vector bundle. These objects have some maps between them and those maps are subject to relations, which I won't get into. In the constructible incarnation, this object corresponds to the following convolution product. These J lambdas and J mu's are Wakimoto sheaves. This Z sub V is gate square central sheaf associated to the G representation V. And C is the maximal indecomposable tilting object in the finite type Hecke subcategory. The first question that you might ask when trying to construct a map out of perf, therefore, is where does this generating object map? One important fact about central sheaves is that they are iterated extensions of Wakimoto sheaves, where the lambda Wakimoto sheaf occurs in the V central sheaf exactly as the weight lambda occurs in the G representation V. So that tells you that ZV is an iterated extension of the J lambdas. Second of all, these J lambdas are certain convolution products of uh, standard, standard and co-standard objects. That means they correspond to the image of the braid group mapping into the affine Hecke category. So if I know what the map should look like from on the braid group, that means I know where the J lambdas should go. They should go to objects in the finite Hecke category corresponding to specific braids, and these objects are called Juices Murphy sheaves. And the last fact that you can take for granted for purposes of this talk is that anything in the finite braid group convolved with that maximal indecomposable tilting object C yields something isomorphic to C itself. These three facts put together imply that if this functor is to be monoidal and to have this restriction to the braid group, that it has to send each generating object to a specific one that I can write down. The Wakimoto's have to go to Juices Murphy sheaves. This Z sub V has to be an iterated extension of J sub nus convolved with C. And each such thing, J sub nu will map to a Wakimoto, which is in the finite braid group, that convolved with C must yield C. So the central sheaf convolved with C must map to some iterated extension of copies of C. Well, C is a tilting object. It has no extensions. So it's just this direct sum indexed by, the, by a basis of V. So it's pretty cool, I think, that the, this one requirement on the functor, together with the very reasonable requirement that it's the identity on the finite type Hecke subcategory, on the standard finite Hecke subcategory completely determines where these generating objects should go. Maps, however, are a different story. In order to understand those maps, we need to say a little bit more than just that ZV should go to some iterated extension of Juices Murphy sheaves. And that's the real meat of Costa's thesis. The first step is Costa tells you where the standard representation, where 
ZV for the standard representation should go. He guesses that it should go to a certain averaging of a parabolic Springer sheaf. So the parabolic that, that is relevant maybe is not surprising. It's the parabolic which fixes a line in the standard representation. In other words, block upper diagonal matrices with blocks of size one and n minus one. In this diagram of stacks, horizontal lines mean adjoint quotients. So this is the is the unipotent radical of that parabolic P adjoint quotiented by P. This is G adjoint quotiented by G and so on. Here U is the unipotent radical of the Borel and this is G quotiented on the left and on the right by U. So if you play around with quotients, you can see that this map pi is basically the, the parabolic Springer resolution corresponding to that parabolic P. Therefore, the parabolic Springer sheaf is what you get when you take the constant sheaf and you push it forward along pi to here. You shift it to make it perverse. Then you pull push the Springer sheaf along these maps, which corresponds to taking a adjoint G equivariant sheaf, remembering only that it's adjoint U equivariant, and then averaging up to make it U equivariant on both sides. Finally, to put it inside some monoidal monodromic Hecke category, you just force the result to be T monodromic by doing some additional projection. So what's the point of this answer? That sheaf in, the, in some monodromic Hecke category that I just constructed is supposed to be where ZV standard goes to under this functor. So that gives us more information than just saying it's some iterated extension. By the way, how do you show it's an iterated extension of Juice's Murphy sheaves? You use base change. You first figure out concretely what is the fibered product here. You use the fact that push, pull, push is the same as pull, push, push. And then you stratify this space so that the result is it has a filtration with associated graded given by the things that you get when you pull back to a cell in the stratification and then push. And the things that you get for each cell, as it happens, it's very beautiful, um, are exactly the Juices Murphy sheaves. So there's a geometric reason why this sheaf is an iterated extension of Juices Murphy sheaves. The main theorem of Costa's thesis tells you what happens when you instead look at exterior powers of the standard representations, that is the fundamental representations of GLN. To state the answer, I'll single in on certain partitions. Lambda sub k is the partition of n given by this hook. It's called a hook because the Young diagram looks like this. And I'll look at the IC complexes of the unipotent orbits given by those partitions. Jordan decomposition tells me that adjoint orbits in of unipotent matrices uh, are indexed by partitions of n. So the main theorem of Costa's thesis is a specific computation, is an explicit computation of what the kth exterior powers of, with respect to the convolution tensor product are for when you plug in these parab the parabolic Springer sheaf that we discussed here. So the surprising answer is that they basically break up into a sum of IC complexes on the hook unipotent orbits. Um, and these points C and D say that the nth exterior power after some averaging becomes invertible and the n plus first exterior power vanishes. These properties are not surprising. They are exactly what you would expect if this sheaf did correspond to the standard representation of GLN. In fact, by a Tanakian argument, these two properties allow us to bootstrap from these fundamental representations to all GLN representations. So that's how Costa's thesis uh, handles the question of where should the central sheaves go for central sheaves coming from any finite, uh, finite dimensional representation of GLN. And it hinges upon this inductive computation of exterior powers, which, and the induction is possible because these answers very surprisingly turn out to be very nice. So that's all I'll say about the approach from Costa's thesis. Now I want to tell you about our joint thoughts on how we might use this co-limit theorem to construct this functor, not just on the perfect subcategory, but on the entire affine Hecke category. To apply this co-limit theorem, remember that we need to do steps one, two, and three from before. So we need to define a functor. We need to define the functor on each largest finite type subcategory, and we need to give some compatibilities. On the largest subcategory, which excludes the simple reflection i, this functor is easy to define. As it happens, it's just basically conjugation by a specific element in the affine braid group. That element is the one that takes the distinguished strand, 
moves it in between the two strands that would be exchanged by the ith simple reflection and moves it back in between the two strands that would be exchanged by the zero simple reflection. And it's possible to write that as in terms of more standard looking elements in various ways. The second step we also know how to do. In order to create a, natural a monoidal natural transformation between two monoidal functors that are both given by conjugation, that's the same as saying that the quotient of the two conjugating elements centralizes the category that we're mapping from. And it's possible to explicitly construct this centralization data. The basic idea is to combine Gatesbury's central sheaves with the centrality of the full twist braid, which comes from this paper on kovano forzansky homology by Kostya and Roman Vesrikopikov. But the interesting point where our strategy seems to break down is at least right now, we don't see any way to check this co-cycle condition between the identifications constructed in step two. So since we can pretend that we're working in an ordinary category, it's a property whether this co-cycle condition holds or doesn't. If it holds, then great, we're done. But what happens if it doesn't hold? Like what happens if this number is just zero, is, is just non-zero? The key idea, which is what I'll spend the rest of the talk discussing, is to sort of say that this is a feature, not a bug. We can define a new category, which is a deformation. So Jordi asks, is the failure clearly a number? Um, I, I actually think the failure is not a number. I think the failure is a number, is, is an element of some abelian group that you can compute using zirkle by modules. And I think the abelian group looks something like the, like a W quotient of the additive group of uh, formal power series at the origin of the torus. So it's it's something that in print, like it is some concrete element of some concrete group, but in order to compute it, we would need to understand these centrality data more precisely. And that's what we don't understand right now. Sorry, I'm having a hard time figuring out what this element BI is. Could you draw it? So. In the like, uh, so for the braid group, I'll use this interpretation that braids look like. I'll use this interpretation of the affine braid group as the ordinary braid group, but with a distinguished strand. So the key is that it's we can allow the distinguished strand to move as well. So what this element is, is it's just the trivial strands. The ordinary strands behave trivially, but the distinguished strand, which plays the role of the puncture in the cylinder, goes out through one of these gaps and comes in through a different gap. <laughs> okay, so I, I, just have, I just have to change my, uh, change my brain so that that, that seam goes straight up. Is what you're telling me? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so maybe I'll try to draw a better picture here. So it goes out through one gap and maybe in through a different gap. And by relativity, you can sort of straighten out the, the distinguished strand at the cost of forcing some of the non-distinguished strands to have to go in, wrap around the distinguished strand, and come back out. And the fact that they wrap around the distinguished strand is what tells you that this has something to do with Wakimoto elements, because the Wakimoto elements are exactly what you get, very roughly speaking, when you take one of these, when you take one of these uh, non-distinguished strands and wrap it around uh, the distinguished one. In some sense. Can you? Are, they, are these the length zero elements in GLN in in the FN of it, the GLN? No. So so the. The length zero elements would correspond to, uh, the length zero elements would correspond to sort of, it, it would correspond to this sort of cyclic shift of these dots. So that, that would be take uh, the non-distinguished strands and just rotate them as the distinguished strand doesn't move. Those are the length zero elements. Is, it, is there a reason you don't use the length zero ones? Um, we actually secretly do use the length zero ones. I just didn't talk about it. Um, I should say that since 
we're talking about GLN here, the length zero ones do appear and they do appear in here. And so they do play a role in constraining what that functor has to look like. And the, the resulting constraints are somehow used in this work in part two. Okay, so going back to this idea of the deformed affine Hecke category, the, the goal is to take this, take these lemons that life gave us and interpret them as additional, these non-zero elements as additional data that we can use to construct a deformed version of the affine Hecke category. By, by construction, there will be a monoidal functor from the deformed version to the finite Hecke category. Uh, to close out my talk, let me tell you a little bit about how this deformation is constructed, or at least our idea for doing so. To say some trivialities, the undeformed Hecke category can be concretely thought of as follows. For each simple reflection, I write down the corresponding largest finite type subcategory. On each size two overlap, I identify the two copies of the next smallest subcategories that live inside the subcategories that exclude I and exclude J. And then at the next level down, I look at the next smallest uh, subcategories and I sort of identify their identifications together in the most trivial possible way. The idea for the deform for the deformation is that since I'm now talking, it is something that's visible already at the level of one categories. Since I'm now talking about identifying functors between one categories, I can choose various natural transformations or natural isomorphisms to do that. And I will, in order to construct the deformed version, choose a non-trivial commutativity natural isomorphism that makes this diagram of functors and categories commute. And even at the one categorical level, you can see that there's some kind of additional co-cycle condition that would appear if I do that. When I look at excluding four simple reflections at a time, I see a tetrahedron whose faces are triangles. And so some kind of composition of natural isomorphisms has to equal some other composition of natural isomorphisms. Anyway, the upshot is that if I modify the commutativity natural isomorphisms for this gluing in this way, I get a different uh, diagram of finite Hecke categories and I can take, which has the same objects, the same morphisms, but not the same commutativity data. And I can take its monoidal co-limit to get the deformed affine Hecke category. And that is why I, I, I that, that's, that's what lies under the hood in our suggestion to use these non-trivial natural isomorphisms, which witness the failure of the construction we wanted to do, to define the, a way to def deform the affine Hecke category. You're basically deforming it precisely to fit the potential failure that might happen. And so this de deformation for that particular co-cycle will admit a monoidal functor to the finite Hecke category. I should emphasize at this point, we don't, we still don't know whether this is zero or not. Maybe this turns out to be zero for some reason we don't understand yet. And all of this work is maybe interesting, but not relevant to that problem. But it could be non-zero. And in that case, we'd like to understand all of these deformations better. We haven't proved it yet, yet but we expect that these deformed versions actually coincide with the ordinary affine Hecke category at the level of the underlying category, but its monoidal structure is different. Specifically, the associativity constraints and the higher constraints should be different. Basically, that's because uh, changing these, changing how these diagrams commute should change how certain diagrams commute, and one such diagram that has to commute for any monoidal category is the, is the associativity constraint. Because of that, we expect that the centers of these two categories, the Drinfield centers, should be equivalent as plane categories, but their braided monoidal structures might be different. And so in the future, we plan to study these categories more explicitly and more, more specifically, we plan to try to describe the center of this category and see how it compares with the center of the category we're trying to map to. I should say that these centers are interesting. The center of the affine Hecke category at the very least from Gatesbury central sheaves, it admits a map from the category of representations of the reductive group in question. The center of the finite Hecke category is some kind of subcategory of G, 
adjoint equivariant D modules on G. So this is something like unipotent character sheaves. And that answer uh, was proved for at the derived level that was proved in um, a paper by David Benzvi and David Nadler. And in an abelian setting, it was proved by Bezer Pavlikov, Finkelberg, and Ostrich. And that result uh, motivates uh, Kostya's idea here to construct, to say where the central sheaves go by first mapping them into some, creating some kind of character sheaf. So this question of computing the center of this category turns out to be really interesting because it seems to be some kind of derived deformation of the category of representations of a algebraic group. And I don't really have any answers to these questions to offer right now, but these are things that we plan to look at in the future. So I think I'll end my talk there. Thanks again for inviting me to speak and I'll answer any questions. Questions or comments? Maybe I'll just follow up on the question um, uh, asked during the break. So the uh, so you, you gave this nice explanation that if you work with contractibility of uh, some complex, is it uh, does this complex have a geometric meaning? I mean, is it is it related to the building or anything like that? So the contractibility that I need in the proof of this theorem is to be precise, a, a subcategory of the arrow category of words. It's a subcategory of arrows, which sort of look like deletions in, in the sense that the objects of the category that I want to show are construct. So I want to show that a certain category is contractible or more precisely that its nerve is contractible. The objects look like arrows in the category of words where this W corresponds to a specific element of the braid group and, and this arrow is not birational, so it's somehow a deletion, it's length decreasing. And the arrows in this category look like diagrams relating you know, one such arrow to another one where the map here has to be uh, birational. So it's sort of looking at all the different simple, all the different simple, simple reflection expressions of a specific braid monoid element and looking at all, but but equipped with a possible deletion that you can do and showing that as these possible deletions move around that they do so in a contractible way now you can interpret this in terms you can interpret any simple any such sequence of simple expressions as some kind of gallery in the building and when i was proving this theorem that's exactly the sort of picture that i had in mind these deletion the 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 picture for proving the Coxeter deletion lemma is very geometric. It basically has to do with, in some sense, the first wall that's crossed twice by this gallery. And the proof of the theorem basically stratifies this category in terms of the first wall that's crossed twice. So it really is very, very much motivated by this, this geometric picture of, of walls and, and buildings and galleries. Can I ask this, this deletion but you're doing a sort of demo zero product. So I'm thinking of it as going SS to S or am I thinking of it as going SS to one? So it sort of doesn't matter. Um, so so a, a, a trick that shows up a lot in, in, in the proof of this theorem is that to describe such an arrow, I, I don't really need to tell you what the target is. I only need to tell you what the parentheses are. So, so what I actually think of this arrow as is, is it's a parenthesized expression of simple reflections. Now, what the product in each parenthesis is, it could be SS, sorry, it could be S, it could be one, depending on which product you're working with, but it doesn't really matter for the proof. It only has to do with shifting these parentheses around. I have more questions about this topological thing while we're on the topic. So, um, so this is sort of like, um, there's sort of an upgrade of this topological question that adds orientations on the cells using the Ninchekman theory. Um, 
Have you looked at this? Yeah, so that that's like the higher Bruja order stuff. Exactly. Um, In other words, so like I, I have a paper where I do this sort of confluence for deletion uh, just with simple reflections though, sequences of simple reflections, not sequences of arbitrary words. Um, and where where it works with the uh, with, with the and checkman order, but of course this is only at, at the one categorical level, not the higher categorical level that you're doing. Right. So I think I talk. think that oh go ahead. Um, yeah, I I I have read a little bit about the and checkman stuff, and I'm I'm also interested in it, but I think it. The, the, the two pictures don't really seem to talk to each other. And, and one specific thing I mean by that is in, in this, I, I think what's really interesting about the man and checkman stuff is the fact that some orientations of these cells seem to be better than others. And I think Ben, in, in one of your papers, you point out that some orientations are better than others because they, they allow you to write these amylogic compilations as something equals something rather than lower order terms. And I, I don't really see any of that in this picture. Um, I, I sort of look at all possible commutativities. I, 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 don't, I don't really distinguish one above another. And, and I, I'm not really sure that the specific contraction I do has any relation to the higher Bruja order either. Especially since you're going from STS to SDS. Right, yeah, the, the whole, yeah, so it's- It's very different sort of picture. It's sort of important to, when, when proving these things, it's sort of important to know what they don't say. They don't give you any kind of fine information about the simple simple generators. They sort of, a, a lot of this contractibility stuff is, it, it only works because you're allowed to collapse everything to STS and not worry about how you're doing it. Right, the lean style, yeah. Right, so, so I, th th that's maybe a good phrase is that all of this stuff is is very much in 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 Deline's philosophy of looking at the reduced lift presentation, and and even though I motivated the theorem in terms of simple reflections, actually simple reflections are not important for proving this theorem. Just a naive question. So, like, uh, sometimes you can uh, argue contractibility. In just using this negative uh, curvature uh, property of the metric, of, so to say, on the building, but that's not, that, that it's not related to the way you prove contractibility. So that's actually a strategy that I looked at um, in the past, but I wasn't able to get it to work. So the way you would look at this negative curvature might be anytime I'm thinking about uh, a space of galleries, I might, and, and, and I want to show that it's contractible, I can, of course, try to contract everything onto a single element. And that's where the negative curvature comes in. The fact that the tits building is a, is a cat zero space tells you that there's a unique path, th there's a unique geodesic or minimal length path, and, and that gives you a gallery, and you can try to contract everything onto that gallery and somehow show that things work because the length decreases at each step. So that was a strategy that I tried. It didn't work. Um, or I couldn't get it to work. The way that I proved that this category of arrows is contractible is actually very funny. I, I embed it into something that I know to be contractible. And then I show that there's a deformation retract from the thing I know to be contractible onto this smaller thing. So that shows that the smaller thing is contractible. And you might think that this is a roundabout strategy, but it's actually exactly what the Coxeter deletion lemma is telling you to do. The Coxeter deletion lemma begins with an expression where no deletions are possible, and then it gives you a canonical way or path to move from the space from expressions where no deletions are possible onto the very small subset of expressions where deletions are possible. So likewise, the idea of my proof is to consider the larger category of all simple expressions, which by Deline we know is contractible, and exhibit a specific deformation retract to, in stages, onto the thing, onto the, onto a certain subcategory where deletions are possible.
Well, I, uh, first I want to make a comment, historical comment, as I tend to do in this program, that uh, I, think, I think initially uh, I got interested in this question uh, of um, categorifying homomorphism from H fine to H in type A after uh, discussions with Ben quite a few years ago, maybe back when Ben was a author. Yeah. I, I, I was going to ask whether, right, so uh, I've, I've, I'll talk with Yes, and then I bugged my successive students with this question, and the result. Uh, but uh, so uh, a question, I don't know if it makes a lot of sense, but so if I understood your point correctly, then this presentation, um, Elias Williamson presentation, um, can be thought of as a sort of truncation of um, uh, what you prove, well, related to a truncation of your theorem, but I mean, so it's a particular truncation, it's like three truncation. Is there a meaningful way to make a sort of four truncation, five truncation? So there's a certain, th there's a few things to say about that question. The first is, um, That the first is that this co-limit theorem here with finite type elements does not actually, you can't go like this. It doesn't actually tell you anything about presentation generators and relations in terms of simple reflections. So I wouldn't say that my thing um, yeah. implies the Elias Williamson presentation in any way. Um, I will say that in this paper, Diagrammatics for Coxeter Groups, uh, Elias and Williamson uh, suggest that the higher dimensional cells in the in the uh, in this Salvetti complex, are where you should look for these for higher term relations when you want to look at a higher truncation. So there's at least for relations that look like something equals something, there's sort of a, a, a clear place to look, and and the you know there there's higher Bruja orders in type A. Um, Roman, as you know, my my undergrad mentee Julian and I to find some potential higher Bruja orders for other types. And that, that would be where you might look for these relations. Um, but, but this work that I'm talking about today doesn't really say anything about what those relations might look like. Can, can, I mean, my, my, my first question when I saw this was, can you get Bruja, higher Bruja orders for other Coxeter groups by taking a co-limit of something over their finite subgroups? <laughs> but that's oh. also hard. Uh, um, I have a student thinking about this now. It's like, and it kind of works for affine type A, but it's still very complicated. It's... That's a really interesting question. Um, Julian and I didn't end up going in that direction, but we briefly talked about it at one meeting. Um, cer certainly, you know, cer for, for affine groups, it certainly looks like you can sort of draw in the orientations of the cells around every finite type facet and sort of force everything to look a certain way. Um, one interesting phenomenon that Julian Wellman pointed out to me is that the resulting posets of simple, so first of all, it, it's not clear what the longest element is. Yeah, so maybe you should look at infinite paths. And then the second thing he pointed out to me, uh, Julian Wellman, was, was that in this poset of infinite paths, it seems like you can have limit points. I hadn't been thinking about the post set of infinite pads at all, and that's pretty interesting. Oh, okay. So, so my, my student has 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 uh, will be writing up his thesis soon, and he says that um, well. So the, the point is that you should be able to do higher Bruja orders, not just for reduced expressions for the longest element, for but for reduced expressions for any element. Um, oh, okay, you sure. Yeah. Of your yeah, you, know, you chop off a good part of your of your CW complex, and then you keep looking. At that sub piece. It's surprisingly hard and technical to do that, actually. It's a lot harder um, than, than the original limit technique. But once you do that, you can apply it to elements in the affine model. Too. I have but no the, doubt that the. Uh, infinite, paths, infinite paths to the long part is another very interesting thing. So, one thing I was a little bit confused by can you just advance maybe one or two slides? Keep going, then keep going, keep going, keep going. Here we go, back there. No, the, 
sorry. Um, back one, I think. Yeah, yeah. So why do you, why is the tensor product over di there? I can understand why why that's the case for the Hecker category, but I would kind of expect that to be over like vector spaces or something because this is just all d modules on G, no? With yeah, so that's a good point. Um, so at a practical level, I want these to be di so that I can then have these i quotients here. But you can ask, why am I allowed to get what I want? And the reason is this, this is a diagram of algebras, which has an initial element. So it, I, I mean, if, I, uh, if I draw okay. out this map of algebras, it's like some algebras, mm -hmm. but they're like shaped in a queue and it has this initial element. So rather than taking the colimit in the category of plane algebras, I can take the colimit in the category of, if I call this a empty set, like a empty set algebras. And then when I do this amalgamated product construction, what it naturally splits out is it's the plane tensor product in the category of a empty set, a empty set by modules. And that's the relative tensor product. So this is just a little trick that um, that I can only use because this this diagram of algebras has an initial element. Thank you. Welcome. Can we go back to the flattening stuff at the end? Uh, um, flattening for me is the math from math find to finite. So oh, okay. taking your your cardboard tube, like your roll of toilet paper, oh, flat, splashing it flat. I see. Um, yeah. Uh, um, so, okay. So first off is, yeah. Uh, so the idea that um, I've been thinking about for a while um, with Matt Hogenkamp was to define these functors on H minus I, I using just the usual degree zero rotation to link um, uh, to, to identify H, H I, I hat with H zero hat. Um, What's the difference between doing that and doing your BI? So BI is, is the rotation combined with a finite rotation. So I think it's exactly the same as what you said. It kind of undoes, it undoes the rotation on other elements or something? Um, so the, Why the finite rotation? like, uh, where is it? So in here you have the element rotation element, which I'll call R. Mm -hmm. It maps here to the coxeter element, which I'll call C. Yes. And if I conjugate by R here, I sort of conjugate by C here. So it's perhaps not surprising that to like to define these functors, to define these partial functors, you, you're sort of conjugating by R to the I somehow. And, and I'm conjugating by R to the I times C to the minus I. Uh, so you're just making it so that it's automatically the identity on the underlying. That's right. Um, this is this this is motivated by the fact that I want the restriction of this factor to the finite type subcategory, which I've called H sub I minus zero, to actually be the identity factor. Right. Okay. I, all right. We should talk because I think I, I know how to show that there's no co-cycle issues. Because for, for for Matt and I, I, th I think we we worked out that there were no co-cycle issues, but what we didn't have is your um, result that you could define a functor if you only had one piece in the heart. Um, so um, maybe we should talk. But sh sh okay. show me that part about about the heart again, because I'm confused about how this works. Right. So I guess that's this one. Yeah. So It's just a general statement about if you have some tilting objects in the domain, and when I say tilting objects, all I need is that positive and negative x are zero, mapping into 
the heart of some T structure, um, then the resulting thing somehow forms an ordinary category. And, and, the, and the idea for, for justifying this is very concrete. It's basically saying, if I told you where all the tilting things go, and I told you where all the maps between them go, how can I construct yes. a map from this? Uh, yeah, I, I know this part. Category of chain complexes, part. and and I think it's possible. Right. So so yeah, certainly that's that's easy if there's no negative s. Yeah, but, but then maybe the question is about the variant, like when you use a weaker condition in. That's right. Exactly the trick. Well, the the. The trick is is just that that since you only want to use this principle to handle the higher associativity constraints, you only need to use this trick for functors from a finite type HECA subcategory, not for functors from the affine HECA category. <sighs> right. I guess I guess that's yeah. I guess that's once you have this way of thinking about it, that does work. I, okay. That's really nice, though. But yeah, I, I think with 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 I think with Matt we explicitly computed these um, closed cycles and they're trivial, so we should go. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> Something sounds I wrote up five years ago. But when you write a paper with Matt Hogan Camp, then nothing actually ever comes up. So there's a minor technical comment, but just to avoid confusion, maybe. So I think you want to work with tilting objects in the monoidal category, you should use this monodromic version because- That's the, right. In the, but yeah, that's- Yep, so, so I've been purposefully ambiguous about whether I'm in a monodromic or strictly t variant setting. Um, just to, for uh, these things, I want to say that this is some monodromic category, and then you have the free monodromic tilting objects. And this is very nice because convolution of two of these is still some direct sum of free monodromic tilting objects. And none of that good stuff would be true if I was in the normal HECA category G mod, B mod. 